All righty, how you guys doing? Good. Ooh, good. All right, good. That's exciting. Terrific, yay. Keeps going. Dr. Leanne, how you doing? Snappy? Feeling snappy? How's that for a word? Snappy. Awesome. Good to see you guys. Okay, is everybody piling in here? All righty. Cool. Well, we're going to go ahead and get started with our study tonight. We've got a lot of ground to cover. And uh, I have another appointment to make uh, after I get done. So i got to scoot out, but Pastor Bobby will be coming up here to do our prayer and praise request. So in case you see this uh, cool tag team preaching thing, that's what's going on. So, uh, but anyway, but uh, good to see you guys. We've got a lot of ground to cover, but we're going to start off, of course, with our announcement. Our first announcement is this one. Pastor Tom Hughes, Lord willing, will be here not July 15th, July 18th. That's right. If you showed up here on July 15th, which is Thursday, you would have a fantastic time with the college career with Eric Castro. That's right here on the front row. Uh, and you can still do that if you want. Uh, but if you want to look at, uh, for Pastor Tom Hughes, you got to wait till the 18th, July 18th, the Sunday. Uh, he's going to be here with us. He's going to be bringing a, a, a great word from the Lord, current events, what's going on, and uh, you don't want to miss it. So Pastor Tom Hughes, Hope for Our Times Ministry uh, in Southern California. So that's our announcement. And uh, we want to thank you guys for coming. And as always, if you're here and if you yet to fill out one of these guys, if you've been coming recently or for 903 years, please fill out a Connect card. Uh, and if you can, basic information you put on there, you got some check boxes, uh, questions, prayer requests. If you could put it in the offering boxes, one of the two in the back of the sanctuary when we exit, that would be greatly appreciated. Because why, Pastor Bobby? So that we can connect with you, Pastor Bobby. <laughs> okay, that sounds great. You're giving Andy a run for his money, but that's right. So we can connect with you. That's right. Uh, so we want to welcome you guys here. But not only are you here, the special guest stars, but we want to welcome our online community. And that's right. We are back in the States. This time we are headed to the East Coast. We're going to say howdy ho to Helen in New Jersey and keep her in prayer. She's at this restaurant and uh, the waiter thought he was being funny, but he took some super glue and now their heads are stuck together. And she's smiling. She's a Christian trying to, you know, do make the best of it. What are you going to do, Victor? You know what I'm saying? Okay, uh, either that or that's her husband, okay, is my theory. So I'm thinking that's her husband, actually. Uh, but we're going to say howdy-ho to Helen. She's been uh, tuning in for a while. And uh, also this guy, because we're behind uh, the eight ball. We got a lot of, uh, we're trying to play catch up with our howdy-hos. But this is Keith in New Jersey. Keith is a cool guy. known him for quite some time. He's been tuning in for years, actually. And uh, he's not just a musician. He's a composer. So a great musician out there in uh, New Jersey. And so we're going to say a big old howdy ho on the count three to Helen and Keith in New Jersey. One, two, three. Howdy ho. That's right. Should have done our New Jersey accent there. Joyzy. I'm from Joyzy. You from Joyzy? Hey, it's Pastelli. How you doing? Okay, never mind. That's right. That's good as it's going to get. But anyway, good to see you guys. Hey, uh, we uh, want to also uh, welcome the rest of our online community. And so we want to uh, encourage you to subscribe to at least one of the seven different ways that we're doing a live stream in case uh, one of them gets knocked off or all of them get knocked off or whatever. But uh, uh, search for my name, Billy Crone, three different ways you can subscribe, three different channels we're running on YouTube. Same thing, search for my name on Facebook, Tracebook, Big Brother. We're watching everything you do, whatever you want to call it. We're using it to share the gospel though, John. Uh, Facebook, uh, search for my name, Billy Crone. There's three different accounts on there or Billy Crone Twitter account. I still can't believe we're on there, but we are sharing the gospel and God's word. Uh, but subscribe. And the reason why is in case they take it down, uh, you can get informed when the studies go out. And you can also share with other people with what time we have left. But if you're missing something, where do you go? That's right, Debbie. Say it again. Get.com. That's right. That's amazing. That's right. Getalikemedia.com. Why are you going on there? Because that's where everything's at the last about 10 years now of material you can download, watch for free. Uh, and that's also where you get the books, the documentaries, and things of that nature that uh, we, uh, you know, uh, don't copyright our material. So make a billion copies. We don't care. And again, that's why we're encouraging you to get the DVDs, even though you can watch the bulk of it for free online, because you have the hard copy. If they wipe out all the online, all the electronic stuff, what do you get to do? You had the fun to copy that baby a billion times. We don't care. Get it out there or turn it back into electronic copy. And uh, we'll play that game as well. So you can also download the Bill Crone app. You can also watch on your TV at our Roku channel. Search for my name. Also uh, on Amazon Fire Stick. Uh, we have our own channel on that for those of you hooked on that. And Amazon Music, believe it or not, and iTunes for those of you hooked on audio. So stay tuned. Be able to share with everybody. 
And, uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to take an offering tonight, and we're going to pray for that, and then we'll pray for our study. If you'd like to give in the offering here tonight, you're more than welcome to do so as we exit on one of the two uh, offering boxes there in the back. Uh, and if you're watching online, if you'd like to give and help us out, that would be greatly appreciated. You can do so in three different ways. You can do uh, look at the appropriate website, look for the mail-in address. You can mail it in, or there on the website, you should see a click uh, donate or give. You can give in that fashion, or even now there should be a number appearing on the screen that you can give in that fashion. Uh, it's a text option that you can give. But let's pray for the offering, and then we'll pray for our study. Father, we love you, and thank you so much again for tonight. And thank you for a great opportunity as your people that we can come and be gathered and nourished in your truth. And thank you that uh, we had the privilege to share you and to seek you and to grow in you. And hopefully and prayerfully that we'd be uh, always being about your business uh, until you come and get us. And so, God, we, we thank you for the privilege it is to give not just again of our time and our talents and our tongue, but also our treasure. And we pray as we give tonight, if we, you so lead us to do so. That we do so biblically, you tell us not to give under compulsion, meaning feeling like we have to or we feel guilty. Not, not at all. That we be cheerful givers uh, because uh, we're thankful, we're grateful. We want, we want to make a difference, uh, even with our finances, God, that souls could be one for you. So please bless this offering tonight, that we would give biblically, that you be glorified in it, that we are church and work towards us becoming better disciples, whatever we need for that, all the resources, you name it that we could, we could have that ability as well, as well as that as a direct result of this offering, the gospel will go forth here in Las Vegas and around the world and lost souls will be won for you. Please bless it, God. And God, now as we turn to your word, once again, taking a look at this good news that you haven't left us hanging high and dry, even though there's an evil one out there and a whole bunch of evil emissaries called demons who are really out to get us every single day. Thank you that we don't have to be afraid. And thank you that you've given us everything we need uh, so that we could stand firm, stand strong, and not buckle, uh, and uh, keep moving forward for you, enjoying the victory you've already won for us. So thank you for that word tonight. Please help us to take it to heart and uh, do what you say so that we can be those fruitful Christians, God, with what time we have left. We ask and pray your blessings upon our study. We ask all this in your wonderful name, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. Amen. Hey, that's right. We're once again in our study dealing with kind of spiritual warfare issues as we're taking just a little hiatus, Lord willing, August-ish somewhere. We're going to be back into our study, Lord willing, on uh, the rise of Satanism and uh, things of that nature for those of you wondering. But anyway, we've already dealt with the temptations from Satan. We dealt with the destruction of Satan, i.e., when we get saved, aren't you glad that uh, plan A, Satan, was to keep us from getting saved so we can go burn in hell? Well, that didn't work. We got saved. So aren't you glad that as soon as you get saved, he leaves you alone? Yeah, right. What Bible you're reading? Apparently, you're not reading the Bible. No, he just switches to plan B. And plan B is to bring destruction, try to destroy your effectiveness, any kind of fruit you could have borne for Jesus Christ. He wants to turn you into a casual Christian, a cultural Christian, a compromising Christian, or a corruptive Christian. You're out there being a tool of the devil, destroying the church, and you think... It's, uh, you're doing a great thing, you're not. Then in the last couple of times, we took a look at God's protection from Satan. Again, that's the good news as we open up in prayer. God hasn't left us hanging high and dry. He's told us clearly, guess what? We are in a cosmic battle, okay? It's been going on for 6,000 years. Satan and demons, it's real. They're really out there to get you, especially if you're living for Christ, especially the moment you got saved. If you're not saved and you're going down the way of the culture, a dead fish floating downstream, he's got you, right? But man, the moment you take a stand for Jesus Christ, you're a target. Now, again, we don't have to be afraid, but let's also not be foolish. The good news is God's given us the protection to stand strong, stand firm, to be victorious. Listen, in every single attack that the enemy could ever throw away, you just got to do what he says to do. And that is get this thing on. That's called the armor of God. And that's where we're at now, right? God told us how many things, what, how many, uh, for those of you hooked on actually seen tonight, uh, how many things that God tells to do to experience his victory, even when the enemy comes after us. Rhymes with two, praise God. Give yourselves a golf clap. Not a full clap, golf clap on the palm right here. That's right. Uh, but uh, yeah, you get to, right, two things, right? And what was those two things? According to the scripture, stand strong in God's mighty power. And number two, put on the full armor of God, right? You don't need to scream at a demon. You don't need to yell and shout at the devil and call out the spirit of this and that. And you don't need to do any of that stuff, right? Two things, stand uh, strong in God's mighty power and put on the armor of God. That's it. 
and you do that, man, you're going to walk in victory that Christ has already won for us. It's fantastic news, okay? Now, we've already seen practically, we broke it down practically. Uh, how do you stand strong in God's mighty power? Well, it's back to what we call the Christian basics, right? Remember that time when you were standing strong in God's mighty power and things were happening, and then, then when you got older and wiser, you just kind of got away from it? Yeah, it's called the Christian basics, right? They're the foundation. Don't ever get off of them because that's how you stand strong in God's mighty power, right? How does that power flow through you on a consistent basis? When you become that glow-in-the-dark saint, not socks, Andy, not socks, a glow-in-the-dark saint, okay? Uh, and you do that by what? Daily Bible reading, daily prayer, daily witnessing to people, daily godly Christian fellowship, daily godly, true godly worship music. Why? Because when you're daily involved in that, what's, where's your mind? Where's the, the it's, you're, you're immersed in God. You're, you're next to him. You're abiding in the vine in Christ. And when that happens, you will bear much fruit. God's power flows through you, right? So that's how you practically stand strong in God's mighty power. Then we took a look. Okay, well, what about that second part? Put on the armor of God. How do you practically put on the armor of God? Well, we saw the Greek says, you don't look at it. You don't stare at it. Okay, you don't think about it and ponder it over a cup of coffee. You put that thing on and there's urgency and you get it on, all of it on. You better get it on now, right? It says, okay, that's great, but, but how do you do that? Well, the way that you do with it is you understand that Paul is using an analogy with this armor of the Roman soldier that he literally wore, okay? But it's not a literal armor that we wear, okay? But it teaches us symbolically of a literal spiritual truth that we need to put on every single day, right? Is what he's saying that. And we've already seen that first piece, of course, last time was what? The belt of truth. And remember what the belt of truth was? The word of God. You need to get the Bible on uh, every single day. And we saw just like the Roman soldier uh, wore it, it tells us spiritually a lot of great things that we need. When you get the word of God on, it's just like that belt that that Roman soldier wore. That belt that the Roman soldier wore held all things together. It kept things from falling apart. It could only be put on by the individual, which makes sense. Serious, it indicated seriousness and support and readiness, and it had a place to hang your victories. And it's the same thing spiritually, right? God says every morning before you go anywhere, you better get the belt of truth on. In other words, you better get into the word of God, right? Because it holds all things together, right? He who does not seek God the first part of the day will scarcely find him the rest. It sets the pace. It gets you going. You put the belt on. And again, what was the another important thing? You need to get the word of God on because the last thing you want to do is walk outside your house and what? Look like a fool with your pants hanging down. Remember that one? Okay, and that's spiritually what's going on. When you leave the house and you ain't got the belt on, you haven't even touched the word of God. Okay, what's going on? That's spiritually, you don't see it, but if you could see it, you're, why would you do that? And you wonder why things are so messed up. You wonder why things are falling apart. You can't keep your spiritual pants up, right? And things are just, there's, well, and there's no victories to hang because you don't have the belt on, right? But uh, that's not all. I'm still preaching on it. And according to the scripture, there's a lot more pieces. So guess what? There's got to be more, and there is, Pastor Bobby. Uh, we're just going to keep shredding this apart. The second piece of armor, God says, you better get on, okay? It's not a bad thing. It's not a threat. It's an encouragement. You, you just do what God says to do. And why would we resist this? Why would we say, I don't know if I got the time. Are you kidding me? If God came up to you and said, hey, I, got, I tell you what, you just do this thing here. And no matter what the enemy throws at you today, uh, you'll stand firm, stand strong, have a fantastic day, enjoy it. Wouldn't you want to do it? Well, that's what we're talking about, right? Why would people resist this? And the second one, as you can see there, is the first one, of course, is the belt of truth. But now we're dealing with the what? The breastplate of, and here's the key word we'll see in a second, is righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness, okay? And, uh, but as always, don't take my word for it. Let's listen to God's. This is the next one in line, right? And again, remember, Paul is using an analogy of a literal Roman uh, outfit, uh, armor, and uh, uniform to teach us a literal spiritual truth, okay? But let's take a look at what's this next piece that God says, get on, get it on now, get all of it on, don't leave anything uh, off, okay, that he says. But here it is, verse 10, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Here's what God says. Finally, be strong in who? In the Lord and in his mighty power. Remember, we saw that every single day. Get into the word, get into prayer, abide in the vine, right? And then he says, then put on the full armor of God. Notice it's not some of it, it's all of it. And he says, so that you maybe might somehow come out on top. 
No, he's very emphatic about it. And this should be good news to us. So that you what? You can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And then he tells us this is real. This is what's going on every day, whether you understand it or not. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, since that's real and that's going on, like it, lump it, leave it or not, whether it's popular to talk about it or not, whether anybody wants to deal with it or not, here's the deal. Therefore, what do you do? Put on the full armor of God so that when, not if, when that day of evil comes, you may be able to what? Stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. All right, well, how do we do that? Well, keep reading. Here we go. Stand firm then with what? The belt of truth, God's word, the Bible, buckled around your waist with the what? What's the second one? The breastplate of righteousness in place. Okay. And uh, again, basically what we see here is God's second piece of, if you will, supernatural military equipment, right? This is total cool guy language, right? And of course, ladies, if you're into guns and explosions and grenades, uh, you can enjoy it too. But anyway, it's God's supernatural military equipment, okay? To what? Uh, To stick on a wall, to look popular? No, to effectively struggle and come out on top, experience the victory if you just put it on every single day, not if, but when the enemy comes, right? And the second one is called the breastplate of righteousness. So obviously, just like the belt of truth, right? It's not a uh, literal belt that you go out and buy at Walmart. It represented something, and we discovered what that was. Same thing with the breastplate of righteousness. What is that? Is that that other exciting piece that you buy when you get to be that volunteer, as we saw last time in those uh, Christmas play, and you get to be the Roman guard, and they stick that helmet on with the plastic things with the spikies in, giving you a headache, and everybody's wondering why you're such a grumpy Roman soldier when you got a massive migraine from those things plugging in your head after that second hour. And then on top of that, then you get the plastic little breastplate thing that costs $2.99, and it's got pokey things. Now your whole chest is all, and you're bleeding. Now, again, I don't know who that was, but I'm just wondering... Right. So, so is that what it is? is it? No, nope. what is the breastplate of righteousness? That's the question, right? Well, all right, let's do what we did last time and let's do our homework. Again, this is going to see a very, very important piece of the Roman soldier's armor that he literally wore, but it's not a literal armor, but it teaches us a literal spiritual truth we need to wear, okay? So let's first of all, see what the literal benefit of the literal Roman breastplate uh, was uh, certainly when it comes from the battle. And the first thing that thing did is it protected from different angles, right? And actually, unfortunately, many times in Christian art or Christian plays, uh, and, and dare I say, maybe sometimes even from the pulpit, people get this wrong. They assume that the breastplate just covered the front. It didn't. It covered a lot more than that. And boy, that makes sense when you consider uh, the spiritual warfare aspect. Let's take a look at this thing. But the Roman soldier's breastplate right, was also known as the Lorica Segmentata, right? Let's say that. Pastor Bobby said it correctly. He said that. That's exactly what I said. He's the only one listening tonight. Let's close in prayer. All right, but anyway, that's right. Uh, Lorica Segmentata. And we all know that that was that Disney cartoon with those animals, and they had that nifty song. And uh, no, that was the, yeah, you know where I'm going. But that's not what this is. This is the Lorica Segmentata, which comes from the Latin phrase, armor in what? Pieces, now referred to an ancient type of Roman military equipment that acted as a type of what? Body armor. So basically in the vernacular, this is their version of Kevlar, right? But it was a full body uh, wrap. We'll see here in a second. It was put together in what? Segmentata, segments or plates, hence segmentata, covered the chest and the what? Shoulders and was made up of four sections, two for the shoulders, as you can see there, two for the torso, both front and what? Back right? So it was not just a front piece. It covered the shoulders. It covered your back, right? The whole middle section, front and back, right? Now it was attached by means of brass hooks. It was joined together by leather laces. You can see there, the guy has it tied up there in the center there and, uh, and fastened internally also with leather straps and metal straps arranged horizontally on the body and they overlapped each other, right? They just kind of overlapped each other. And the benefit of that was it was allowed them to basically compress it right? So it's, it's in these segments that overlap. So you could make it, it be compact. So when you got it off, it didn't stay that same size. It just went, right? Kind of like a little slinky, right? Slinky, but it goes back. But that's the way it was designed. And that helped him with travel. And it wasn't just because it was a big piece of equipment, right? 
but it helped them do that in segments. Now, it was also, again, it covered the shoulders and the chest and the front and back. It offered, here it is, good protection from spears, right? What do we see later? Paul talks about that the enemy throws at you. Darts, right? And things of that nature. You got this baby on, them darts are going to bounce right back off. And we'll get to that, Lord willing, eventually. But in, it protects from spears, from missiles, from swords, and knife piercings, right? Knife piercings. In fact, the testing of this modern replicas of this type of body armor demonstrated, listen, it was impenetrable to most direct hits and missile strikes. You weren't going to get through this. The enemy can come straight at you, man, with a knife, a spear, whatever. It's just going to bounce right off, right? The Romans knew what they were doing when they designed this breastplate. Uh, for well, okay, and that's why again you want to make sure you had this thing on. But as you can see there was a lot more going on with this breastplate than sometimes is taught or depicted. Okay, it basically was the central piece, okay, of the Romans' armor. We saw the belt. The belt held all things together, and we're just getting started. And that's why when you get it on, the belt kind of cinches it up, but it also everything attaches to it, keeps it in place from wiggling around when you're trying to run and fight in the battlefield. But this thing was the whole torso. It's the midsection, the whole central part of the body. And without this, think about this, put yourself in an actual Roman battle. Without this piece, you're toast. I mean, you're completely vulnerable, right? Uh, if you just had the belt on, then that's okay. They can, hopefully they only try to stab me here, <laughs> you know? But with this thing, it didn't just protect a huge part of the body. And again, notice it wasn't just the front, it was the back and the top, the shoulders, right? Okay, but think about what is in your body that they're trying to protect with that thing. It's all your vital organs, ma'am, right? And, and think about it. I mean, that's your lungs, that's your heart and things of that nature, right? And think about it. Like when you're in a battle, if somebody gets you the sword with the arm, okay, you can survive that and you can keep fighting. Somebody gets you and stabs you or throws a spear at you and gets you in the leg, ouch, yeah, that's gonna hurt, okay? But guess what? You can still keep fighting, right? And on and on it goes, okay? But if you didn't have something to protect you, get a spear in your lung, you're done. Pierces your heart, you're, it's over, you're dead meat. You ain't going nowhere, right? This is what this breast place was. It was all this important uh, protection. And again, it wasn't just in the front of you. And again, this is where people get it wrong. It was protecting you from the top, right? And because sometimes, you know, the missiles would come. And as we all know, when they shot things at you, they always came directly at you at the front. No, they're kind of, right? And so maybe you didn't have the danger of it hitting you, you know, uh, like a, somebody's trying to stab you with this and okay, well, you're protected here, but what about the, the things that they're throwing at you, the spears or the arrows, right? They can come and get you right here, right? And so that protect that. And not only that, but at what? Because we all know that uh, when you're in a war, that uh, if, if you ever turn your back, then everybody goes, okay, hold on, hold on, take a break, take a break, wait for them to turn around because we can only stab them in the front because that's what we do. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's war, man. Hand-to-hand -hand combat back in the Roman times, certainly. And it's wherever you can get them is where you're going to try to get them, right? But this thing covered all that in the vital organs. This thing, could you see how important this thing was? And this is what Paul is saying. There's something here they literally wore, and this is what it literally did, that we, it's teaching you a spiritual truth that you better get on. It's, it's that important as well, okay? It is protecting uh, from all different angles. Now, think about that. Doesn't that make sense with Satan? Because again, because Satan, when he comes, he's only going to hit you from the front where you can see him clearly coming, right? Every single time. Now he's an opportunist. What's he going to do, right? He's going to try to get you from the top. He's going to try to get you from the side. He's going to try to stab you in the back. He's going to try to get you when you're not seeing, when you're not looking right. And so again, what a great analogy for spiritual warfare is Paul using, right? Man, this makes a lot of sense, man. I need to have this kind of protection on too for me because the enemy, he isn't just going to come at the front. He's going to come at all angles. But what did the breastplate do? It protected from all angles, right? So then that leads us to the question is, well, what kind of a breastplate is this? The breastplate of looking cool. No, it's the breastplate of, what's that? Oh, I wasn't done with my funny puns. You were supposed to give me an option there. At least, you got to at least run with three, then you can get to the actual point. That's the rule, the crone rule. But we'll just skip it because now we're way off base and I won't be bitter about that. Okay, it's the breastplate of righteousness. It stole my thunder. I'll tell you what, whatever, yeah. No, the breastplate of what? Righteousness, right? That's exactly what it was, right? 
Uh, and so that tells us what it is, right? And again, think about who we're up against. What's he all about? What's he coming to do? He's coming to get you at the full front or at the top or at the back or from the side. He's an opportunist. Satan's trying to get you to read the Bible. No, Satan's trying to get you to obey God. No, what's he doing? Anything he can do the opposite of what God says to do, which is called unrighteousness, i.e. sin. Do you get it? So it's not just a breastplate that protected you from all angles because that's what the enemy does, man. He's gonna come at you from all angles. But you put this on, you're well protected. But again, it's the breastplate of righteousness, right? And that makes sense. So the one who is going to come at you, who is the birthplace, by the way, of unrighteousness, he is going to try to get you to do unrighteous things, i.e. sin. And so that's what this thing does. So in essence, basically Paul's saying, you put this thing on and all the attempts from the enemy to get you to do something unrighteous, sinful against God, it'll just bounce right back off. Isn't that good news? Right? It's fantastic news. Now let's tear it apart a little bit more. Okay. And the Greek word, your righteousness is dikaiosune. Let's say that. I know, Pastor Bobby, they did it again. They got it wrong. Uh, Dikaiosune, it means this, right living, this is important, right living as defined by God. Now, boy, you can just stop there for a second. Isn't that the problem today? People say, well, it's right living because that's the way I feel. It's my lifestyle. It's my choice. It's the way I, no, that's relativism. Scripture has do's and don'ts, and they came from God. Why? Because God's God. God's the one who created everything. Uh, it's his world. It's his people. It's his earth and everything on it, Psalm 24, and he can do whatever he wants. Last time I checked, he's big enough to make up the rules, right? And he is holy, holy, holy. He is righteous, so uh, he can do it, and he does, right? So it's right living, the kaiosune, righteousness, the breastplate of righteousness is right living as defined by God. Not you, not man, not society, not peer pressure, not social media, not the government, God, right, is the key word that's used there, right? And it speaks of not just integrity and virtue and purity of life, but one that is defined as God defines purity, virtue, character of life, i.e. that which emulates his character, which is righteous and only righteous, okay, is what he's saying. And God says, this is the breastplate that you need to put on every single day. Because again, the enemy who is the birthplace of unrighteousness is coming at you to get you to listen, live like him, the exact polar opposite of God every single day. And again, for proof of that, Ezekiel 28, Isaiah 14, if you ever want to do the homework, Isaiah 14, Ezekiel 28, the two classic passages that gives us great detail about the fall of Satan. Right? And here's what Ezekiel 28 says. You, speaking of Satan, were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till what? Wickedness was found in you. Now, what's really cool there, wickedness in the Hebrew, okay, is actually a cool Hebrew word, okay, of all, okay? And of all is, uh, means simply unrighteousness, right? So again, it fits again in Ephesians 6, the breastplate of what? Righteousness to counteract what? Unrighteousness. In fact, that's what caused the fall of Satan, not just wickedness, but in the Hebrew, it literally means unrighteousness, right? The exact polar opposite of who God is, righteous. Satan is unrighteous, and that's what he's all about, right? And so God says, you put on this breastplate of righteousness, it is meant to, listen, counteract the unrighteous attacks of the unrighteous one. Now, do you get it? I'm kind of belaboring that point. It's not by chance. We're just doing our homework, milking for all it's worth. It's not just something that's covering you. It's called what it is to cover you because every single day when you get out of bed, whether you like it, lump it, even acknowledge it, leave it or not, it isn't just the enemy's going to come out at you. God tells you what he's going to do. He's not going to come. And if you're, I wonder if that voice was from God. It's pretty simple, folks, right? Uh, Satan is not going to encourage you to read the word of God and put that belt on. Satan is not going to encourage you to live a righteous, holy, pure life, emulating God's holy character right? The spirit of God will. Okay, but not this, not Satan, not demons, okay? You, they're going to come at you every single day to try to get you to live unrighteously, right? Now, listen, notice again, the breastplate covered all angles because again, that's what he does. Uh, in fact, this is what's cool. There's kind of like a, 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 not just an urgency here, but God is saying, man, you've really got to take this serious. And that's the, the Greek there literally says, you don't just put it on or have it in place, as some translations say. The Greek literally says, you need to, I, I love this word here, you need to immerse yourself in it, right? 
And so, so the, the, it, it's, a, it's a complete, full immersion. It's, it's the Greek word in duo, and it means to listen, sink into, to totally clothe oneself in, right? And, and it isn't just some, you just slap it on. You literally sink into this baby. It's completely uh, uh, it, it exposed. It's, it's everywhere where it needs to be. And again, think about spiritual warfare. Uh, do you want to just haphazardly put this thing on? Do you want to just like, well, it's on good enough. I'll adjust it later. Or I, I got most of it on. Okay, I got three-fourths of it on. Okay, this part's kind of exposed, but I'll deal with it later when my calendar opens up or, or maybe after lunch when I got more time. What's he say? You, get it on, you make sure you're completely immersed in this complete armor and it's covering every single portion that it's supposed to cover, right? Now, again, why? Because that's what the enemy does. Now, listen, as we're gonna see, he doesn't just come at you every single day, okay? And he's trying to get you to live unrighteously, because that's who he is and that's what he does. That's his mandate, okay? But you think about it, how does he get through? Because I don't know if you notice this, but, well, nobody in this room, of course, but have you heard about those Christians after they get saved, they still blow it? I know, it's weird. I heard stories. I know they're in like 14 states away, but, but you know, pray for those unfortunate people. Yeah, no, it what happens. So guess what? You're gonna see, what, 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 how does that happen? Because guess what? You didn't get the armor on. And or you didn't, you didn't do what God said to do. When we don't do what God says to do, the two things, stand firm in his strong and mighty power, and you don't get this armor on, then there was something wrong. Not with what God, God gave everything we needed. Isn't that exciting? We got tricked into not doing what he said, right? And with his armor, if you leave a piece off, that's why he stresses, get it on, get it all. The what armor of God? What's well, the word he says there multiple times? The full armor of God. You better get it all on every single day, every single time. And the good news is, you're safe. Have a great day. But a sure sign that a Christian forgot some armor, was haphazard about it, uh, like this one says, you need to be totally immersed in it, okay? Uh, the fact that you did blow it and committed unrighteousness, guess what? You didn't do what God said to do. You didn't immerse yourself uh, into it. Listen, you left an area exposed, I mean, you leave an area exposed and you think, well, it's not that big of a deal or maybe it's just a small piece or I'll get to it later. No, basically what you did is you left a crack open in the armor and that's exactly what the enemy waits for. He waits for you to get lazy, right? And again, this is why it says immerse yourself into it. Get all that on. Let all that segmentata touch every area that it needs to touch, the whole thing. Don't do it halfway, right? Or don't get it, or, or leave, okay, there's a little bit of opening here, but we'll, no, because that's where he's going to stab. He's not dumb. He's looking for a crack in your armor, right? Either pieces you flat out don't even have on, okay? Or you didn't take serious the pieces that you need to put on. One guy puts it this way. He says, listen, no Roman soldier would have thought of going into battle without his vital organs protected. Because it's common sense. You could take a shot in the thigh. You could take a shot in the arm. You could take a shot in the shoulder. But man, you get one here in the midsection, that's serious, okay? And so it is, listen, with our spiritual battle. He says, if, if there's a weakness in your armor, a chink in your armor, sins, acts of disobedience, wrong attitudes, if there's unconfessed sins, unrepented sins, you are vulnerable. And if you're courting sins and flirting with sin, you're gonna fail. And that's what happened. He said, uh, he gives an example of one of my friends. I had a friend in high school. He was a youth leader in his church. And, and his first year at college, he collapsed morally because there were issues that I could see in his life and walk with Christ as a high school student, but they weren't being dealt with. But guess what? Eventually, you left that crack open. What's the enemy do? That's where he goes. All right? That's what he waits. He just waits for you to get lazy. And he's going to stab at that crack every single time. He said, you see, when Satan sees sin, he moves into that crack. And you become vulnerable as the world system appeals to that crack in your armor. And the smallest crack can be exploited in a very fatal way. And that's why the Bible says, listen, make no provision, i.e. don't open the crack, open that door for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Oh, you might have the commitment, I'm committed to Christ. And you might have eagerness, I'm gonna follow Jesus. You may even say, yeah, I wanna go to seminary, I wanna train, I wanna serve the Lord. But you better have this breastplate of righteousness on. Why? Because without righteousness, you leave yourself open to certain death right? But with righteousness, as with the breastplate, the enemy's attacks are thwarted. So again, that's the good news. You get it on, you get it all on, get completely immersed in this baby, right? And then have a great day.
There is no crack for the enemy to jab you with, work you in, right? And sometimes it could just be the smallest thing. I like, I, I, I don't know if it was Adrian Rogers, whoever said, but he said, and this is wild. He said, sometimes Satan patiently works on somebody as long as 40 years just to set them up down the road. And, and what happens is it's just, it's just a little teeny tiny crack there, just a little. And, you, and, and time has gone by and you think you're getting away with it. And of course, I'm talking about sin. And then it's just, it's just yeah, okay, well, it can't be that bad. And, and then what happens is the enemy, that gives them, that gives them room to stick it in there, right? And then what, what's he do over time? He starts wiggling in it. Well, he's got, he hasn't gotten to your vital organs yet, but he's, he's got just enough room to get that knife point in there, right? And then he starts whittling, 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 get bigger. And just over time, it just gets bigger and bigger. And then at the right time, comes in and gets you. He's an opportunist. And, so, and that's what Paul says. You need this thing on, all of it, all of God's armor. We're just dealing with the breastplate of righteousness now. But uh, make sure you're completely immersed. Do not leave a crack open. Now, again, what is sin? Sin is unrighteousness. And this is the breastplate of righteousness. If you put the breastplate of righteousness on, there is no crack to jab, to work 40 years, four seconds, four minutes, nothing. It all bounces off just like the Roman weaponry. So that leads us to the next question, okay? Uh, and thing that uh, this thing did for the Roman soldier. And just like the belt of truth, you're going to see this with all pieces of the armor. It's got to be put on by somebody else, right? You got to wait to show up on Sunday services or Wednesday night if you're really spiritual. And then as you enter the door, one of the deacons is going to put this on for you. Isn't that great? We're all servants of the body. No, it has to be put on by me right? Only I can do this. In fact, that's what exactly what the Greek says. Having clothed yourself with the breastplate of righteousness. I, I, I'm the only one that could do this. You're the only one that could do that for you. You can't hire somebody to do this. You can't tell your kids to do it for you, right? You can't uh, uh, expect your spouse to do it for you. You can't wait for the pastor, the elders, the deacons to do it for you. You alone must take the initiative. You yourself put this breastplate of righteousness on, okay? And again, that's common sense, okay? Now, again, so that's great. If I put this thing on, I'm the only one who could do it. And it, it counteracts all the unrighteousness attacks. And if I immerse myself in, in, into it, and I put it all on, I do it myself every single day, then I'm guaranteed that there's no crack. The enemy can't get me. I'm standing strong. I'm moving forward for the Christ. But that leads us to the next big question. Okay, what kind of righteousness? What are you talking about here? Now, there's actually two options. And I'm going to give you both options and I'm going to tell you which one I more land on, okay? And uh, the first option, you're like, okay, so what is this righteousness that I need to put on to counteract the unrighteous attacks of the evil one so I don't have a crack for him to work with, right? Well, the first option is what's called positional or imputed righteousness, okay? And let me explain that. This is the righteousness that was given to us in Christ, which was, quote, imputed to us, uh, by his death on the cross, right? And we see that. Here's just one passage of scripture dealing with that. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, God made him, i.e. Jesus, who had no sin to what? To be sin for us. Why? So that in him, Jesus, we might become the what? The righteousness of God, okay? In other words, we are made righteous with God through the righteousness of guess who? Jesus Christ, okay? Uh, it, the, the imputed, uh, to me, it, it's an accounting term. Really? And really what you're talking about, man, this is, if you don't know this as a Christian, you need to know this. You need to know the positional truth that we have in Christ because this is, this is at the heart of being able to go to sleep at night knowing that you, as Romans 5 says, you have peace with God. Why? Because it's all done in Christ. This is why we have eternal security because it's his righteousness, not mine, right? This is what it is. Now, this is what's called, or what at least I call, God's divine uh, ledger, okay? And, and here's basically what the scripture teaches us. And that's just one passage, right? God took, listen, he took all my unrighteousness, all of my sin, placed it on the cross with Jesus Christ. And he put that on Jesus' ledger, on his side of the accounting book. 
right? Then at the same time, God takes all the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ and he puts that on my side of the ledger. Pretty good deal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's awesome, right? All right? And that's again why I'm eternally secure in my salvation because it's not based on my righteousness. Are you kidding me? If it was, none of us would get there. Myself included, we all go burn straight into hell. But this is God's divine accounting, right? It's based on the righteousness of Christ that's imputed to me. My righteousness, the scripture says, is as filthy rags. And you're right. It's like you've been reading the Hebrew there, John. That term is very graphic uh, in the Hebrew. I mean, here you are, you set your throne room scene and, and, and God is holy, he is holy, he is holy. Uh, the train of his robe fills the temple and, uh, and the prophets are going, ah, I'm going to die, you know, and, and it's serious, intense stuff, the holiness of God, right? And then you get up there and you think you're going to get to heaven and have a relationship with God by your own righteousness. God says, here's what you basically did if that's your attitude. And you think you can, by your own bootstraps, get yourself into heaven. Uh, you, you, just, you just threw a filthy rag before the holy, holy throne of God. In the Hebrew, it's menstrual rag. To use a vernacular, that means what? It's a tampon. And that's how God looks at these people thinking. Think of all the cults who are trying to get to heaven by their own works. Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, dare I say even Christians or people who say they're Christians, but yet they still think it's by works you get there, which statistically in the so-called American church is a very high number. It's it, What? Seventh-day Adventists, things of that nature, all these people that think that it's by works you're going to get there, they are in for a rude awakening. Because basically what they're doing, a menstrual rag on it has, and this is graphic, but this is God's word. A menstrual rag has on it what? Blood. So basically what you're doing before God with your own works is saying, I don't need the blood of your son, Jesus Christ, and his righteousness imputed to my account. I'm going to get there with my own blood. Here you go, God and you throw a tampon before his throne. Yeah, good luck is right. But that's what God says, right? But this is the benefit of the imputed righteousness. I'm not attempting that. That's not what I'm trusted in because I know my righteousness is filthy rags before God's holy throne, right? And I say this all the time. If God's salvation was not 100% complete in Jesus' work on the cross and his righteousness being imputed on my unrighteous account, we're all doomed straight to hell right? But that's the good news. He's what? That's God's divine ledger. He takes all of Christ's righteousness, puts it on my account, takes all my rottenness and unrighteousness, and he puts it on to Jesus' crown on the cross. This is why, as we saw before, God can call me and you, any born-again Christian, listen, a hagias. Let's say that. Three for three, Pastor Bobby, but we're not going to make a big deal of it, are we? But no, hagias, which means what? That's where we get the word saint from, and a saint is a biblical term, meaning holy one. It's a positional truth. You ever wonder why that? You know, the, the, of course, unfortunately, the Roman Catholic Church, which is a pseudo-Christian cult, thinking that you're going to get there by sacraments, right, as we dealt with before in our 12-week study, which is what? Basically, what are they doing along with the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons? They're going up there with a tampon and throwing it for, <laughs> you're in trouble. Okay, uh, but, but basically, so a saint isn't something that some church council from Catholicism says that, they're a great person later, and now you can pray to them, and here's a new figurine for you to buy, right? Because that's, that's how it goes, right? And by the way, the scripture says never to pray to dead people. It's called necromancy. God forbids that. That's a whole other aspect. We've already dealt with all that. But, uh, but that's not what a saint means. It's hagias. It, it means holy one. Every born-again Christian is a saint. Did you know that? Every born-again Christian is a hagias. Every born-again Christian is, listen, as a holy one. But have you ever wondered this? God, how could you call me a holy one? when I know I still blow it. Because God doesn't see us as we see us. It's a positional truth. God only sees us like he sees his son, Jesus Christ. As if, listen, we've never sinned. That's justification. As, it's just as if I've never sinned. Isn't that wonderful? That's why right now, not in the future, right now, I can have an intimate personal walk with Jesus Christ. That's why I right now can be indwelt with the whole, Holy Spirit of God because I'm now imputed the righteousness of Christ and I'm considered a 
holy one. That's why we can have that relationship. You see what I'm saying? Isn't it wonderful? That's why I don't have to be afraid of ever losing my salvation because it's not my salvation. If I think I'm going to get there on my works, I'm toast. But it's all in Christ. Isn't that wonderful? That's what's called positional uh, truth or imputed positional righteousness. So my question, I explained all that. It's fantastic news, isn't it? Okay, so that's option number one. Is this the kind of righteousness that Paul is saying that this breastplate represents that we need to put on every single day? Okay, and our struggle against demons when he's trying to come at us with this unrighteousness and the sin every single day and we come back with imputed righteousness? Is that what he's talking about? I don't think so. But I will say this as a caveat, um, it, but let me explain first why I don't hold to that position, that what Paul's talking about here is we need to put on the imputed positional righteousness of Christ every single day in the breastplate. Because this, here it is, the righteousness of Christ, which we just talked about, is something that's what? Given to me. The breastplate of righteousness, Paul says, is something we what? We do. See what I'm saying? So there's a difference there. The righteousness of Christ is something given to me. The breastplate of righteousness is something that we put on. One is a gift. The other one is something that I do, right? However, I will say this. I do believe that positional righteousness is something that does come in handy in our daily struggles when we fail to put on the breastplate of righteousness. And let me explain that. One guy says this. He says, the only reason why I stand righteous before God is because of Christ's righteousness being imputed on my account. His righteousness will never fail. Regardless of the duration or the intensity of the battle, the righteousness of Christ will always prevail. Satan, he comes at us and he says this, look at you, look at how you just exploded in anger, so-called Christian. Look at how you just lied to cover your tracks. Look, look at how you lusted after that person, some Christian you are. How do you answer his charges? Simple, you answer by applying the imputed righteousness of Christ. You're right, Satan, I did just sin, but my eternal life does not depend on my sinless behavior, my righteousness, or my perfect track record. I am trusting in the blood of Jesus Christ, and it's his righteousness that is accredited to my account, so take it up with him, All right? He said, this is our only hope for eternal life and our defense against Satan's accusations when we fail to put on the breastplate of righteousness. So I don't think that's the righteousness Paul's talking about, but I think it comes in handy knowing this truth when you don't do what God says to do and put this righteousness on. So that's again, okay, so what is it? Well, it's your second option. And this is the one that I think he's talking about. And that's called practical righteousness. Okay, uh, because again, one's given, but this one says, you need to do it. You need to put it on. And, and that's not imputed righteousness, Right. Now, let me explain, and let me, let me explain further. Uh, this is not talking about self-righteousness. We just talked about that. That's what the cults do. That, they're thinking that you're going to, by self-righteousness, you're going to get yourself into heaven. Uh, that's what the Pharisees did, uh, that they were self-righteous, right? And they looked so good on the outside, but inside uh, they weren't. Rather, what this is talking about is the daily process, dare I say, of Christian maturity, right? When you start off as a Christian, what is the Bible liking you at? What physical stage are you at? You're as a baby, babes in Christ. And you, as the scripture says, you long for the pure milk, right? But do you always stay at the milk? No. As you grow, babies don't always just eat milk. How many parents, especially the wives, how many were very excited when that child could finally start to eat the mush, that little rice thing, whatever, because now they at least slept for at least 25 seconds longer, right? <gasps> right? Because, right? And so, but then eventually they were able to eat meat and then they kind of slept through the night, right? And then all, you know, so, but again, it's the normal process. And that's another analogy that Paul uses that we start out as babies, right? And we start off with milk and then we get to the mush, but then you need to mature and grow up to become an adult Christian who can handle the meat of God's word. In fact, that was his rebuke into the letter of Hebrews. Paul says, listen, by this time, you guys ought to be teachers. I, 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 you're acting like a bunch of babies. You're still at milk stage. I don't want to go over this baby stuff when you first get saved about baptism and this kind of stuff. You, you, you guys ought to be teaching. You ought to be adults by now, right? And, and, and that's, what, that's what he's talking about here. This is Christian maturity, right? That as we, listen, the longer, how, 
I've said this before many times. I don't care. Maturity is not based upon a so-called Christian's length of time of being a Christian. Maturity is shown in your life. And how do you know you're mature? The more you look like Christ. I don't care if you say 40 years. I've seen some people that have been saved for 40 years. You're walking around in spiritual diapers. Man, you get, you get, you're making stinky messes, man, all over the place. You ever run into those folks? And you know how babies, they get cranky and mean? <laughs> right? Okay, obviously not our kids, but yours, you know. Anyway. <laughs> right? I've met some people that have been saved for a long time. Man, it's like, man, you're, you're putting some non-Christians to shame with the words coming out of your mouth or the behavior you're exposing. I don't know, maybe you're saved, maybe you're not. I don't know the heart, but man, I don't, length of time has nothing. Although I have seen some people that have only been saved for a year or less. Man, they are walking close to Jesus Christ. They're growing in maturity. Why? Because have you ever prayed as a young Christian? God, make me more like you. Make me more like Jesus. Conform me to the image of Christ. That, get me from this baby stage to an adult and use this life. Be a positive advertisement for Jesus. That's the righteousness, the practical righteousness. It's not self-righteousness. It's now we're saved. Now we want to grow up in Jesus to be a good advertisement for Jesus, emulating his character. As the scripture says, be ye holy as I am holy. Not because we're trying to earn. That's already been taken care of with the imputed righteousness, right? Now I want to be a positive advertisement for Jesus and I want to go out there and make a difference like Jesus did, right? That's what I think he's talking about, okay? And, uh, and this is the daily choice that Paul says we need to do. We need to daily put this armor on. And Paul, believe it or not, I think he alludes to this in another passage in Romans. Uh, and this is another daily choice that we have to make. And I'm going to bring that out to you in the Greek. Romans 6, 12 to 13, Paul says this, Therefore, do not let what? Sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires, right? Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as what? Instruments, pay attention to that word there, instruments, instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, okay? Now, Paul's doing something here cool in the Greek. And when he says there to offer up the members of your body as instruments of righteousness, the word there for instruments, this is cool, it's hoplon. And I don't know about you guys. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember ba uh, black and white TVs, but uh, remember watching those Westerns and here comes that show, Hoplon Cassidy, right? Riding that horse and that's that. Uh... No, that's not at all what he was talking about. I know you were thinking that, Andy. And again, I had to clarify that just for you. It's not Hoplon, it's Hoplon. Now, Hoplon was a weapon, right? It was a weapon that the guess who wore or had the Roman soldier, right? A hoplon was a weapon. It's not just an instrument. God said, I need to be an instrument of righteousness. Okay, I'll be a bugle. <laughs> no, he's talking about an instrument of warfare. And again, this fits the, the Ephesians 6. This is Romans 6. We're talking about the armor of God in Ephesians 6. Paul's the same author. And I think there's a little bit of uh, blurring here in a good sense of what he's talking about. Every day we need to listen, choose to what? Offer our bodies as weapons of war for God. Listen, not as weapons of war for Satan because it's gonna be one. Now listen, did you know that when you get up every day, you're gonna be one of the two? And what Paul is saying here in Romans 6 is your life Christian is that weapon. And when you get out of bed, your daily choice is, guess what? Whose weapon are you going to be? And if you choose, because it's your choice, you're going to say, man, I started out great, but the rest of the day, man, what a sinful mess. Well, I don't know where it was, but you need to pay attention to your thought life, number one, back up the train, and I'll guarantee you, you made a choice. The enemy came at you, found a crack, worked in you, you made a mistake, you didn't get the armor on, you didn't stand strong, because if you did, you don't have a problem. But the fact that you had a problem is you made a mistake. You need to analyze that. Where did it go? When did it start? Because at that point, you chose to become an instrument, listen, of Satan. I'll never do that. I'll never become an instrument of Satan. Your life is that weapon. And so every day, Paul says, you better get this armor on. And you've got a choice to make every day. Whose weapon of warfare am I going to be? Uh, by the way, 
if you choose to be a weapon for Satan, then as one guy puts it, you're committing spiritual high treason because you're actually now fighting against your own captain, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave you the victory in the first place. It's like a traitor, isn't it? That's serious stuff. Aren't you glad we're trusting in the imputed righteousness of Christ? But that's serious stuff, though. Do you want to be known as a traitorous Christian? No, I, I don't want to. Okay, so, so again, don't be a weapon for Satan. This is what Paul is saying. Don't commit high treason, okay? And again, this is why Paul says later in Ephesians 6, put on the breastplate of righteousness. It's, but I take it as basically the same thing he's saying here now in Romans 6. It's the daily choice, okay? And in both cases, he says, choose righteousness, put on righteousness as a breastplate. Why? Because that's what keeps you, watch this, from committing high treason against God. Not because we're trying to earn our way to heaven, not because we're trying to keep our way to heaven, because I am so thankful for what he's done. Who wouldn't want to follow him after all he's done? Out of graciousness and mercy, don't you want to be used of him to say, thank you, Jesus? And isn't just it just awesome that God would even use us, that we even have the option after not just what we did in the past, but we still blow it even today. And he's still, every day we have an opportunity to be used of him to do something splendid for him. And what's the motive? As Christ says elsewhere, Christ's love compels us. I'm not doing it because I'm scared of going to hell. I'm not doing it because I'm trying to maintain my salvation or, no, I love him. I don't want to hurt him. He's my heavenly commander. And just like in a war, what kind of soldier would I be if I turned around and started attacking my fellow soldiers or even my commander? Don't do that. You're supposed to fight the enemy. And that's what Paul is saying. Uh, with that. And I, I, I will say this. I don't think it's by chance the order, you know, of the events that we have here. The belt of truth, which is what? The Bible and the breastplate of righteousness. And if we're talking about making that choice first thing in the day, God, please. And this has been part of, I'm not saying this to boast, but this has been part of my prayer in, in mornings. God, use this life as an instrument of righteousness today not of wickedness. Please keep me from the evil one. From the, I don't want to be an instrument of wickedness. Please, 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 right? I mean, I, I actually personally verbalize that because, because of this truth. But listen, what's the first one though? Word of God. Can I tell you something practically? To make this decision on the second one, God, please, before you even leave the house, God, please, I want to be an instrument of righteousness, not of wickedness. If you can't even start your day off by getting into the word of God, your mind's not even ready for the second step. You're off running outside the house. You're not even thinking about it. But when you're in the first one, you put that belt of truth on, and guess what? Guess where your mind's on? It's on the things of God. You start your day instantly thinking about God. And you know what? Instantly going, yeah, that's right. And God's word says, I'm in a battle, and I got to take this serious. And I got to do this and God, please. And so your mindset is ready by this first step to do what you need to do in the second step. Do you get it? I don't think the order's by chance. You skip that first one, odds are you're probably not going to be thinking about the second one. Okay. But Paul is basically calling us to live a holy, pure life each and every day. Okay. In order to what? To stand strong against the wiles or the schemes of the evil one, the devil. Okay. And again, choosing purity over something. Okay. Should be common sense right? Why would you choose to ingest something that's full of disease and yuckiness? And I mean, is, is, that's just, do you really need a teaching about that? Do you really need to be encouraged, right? It, it, it's like this, purity matters, especially when it comes to water, right? Watch this. Excuse me, do you mind taking part in an experiment? We're actually testing people's preference for water. Would you rather drink from this bottle of water or from this bottle? Well, there's actually there's six mouths on it right now. Which one would you rather drink from? This one or this one? Sure, this one? Why? 
because I don't know where that mouth is. Well, I, I don't know. This one looked pretty good. Everybody seemed to like it. <laughs> I'm sure they did, man, but I'll go with that You instead. know what? I, I think I have good authority. Only one of those people is really sick. What about if I give you five bucks to drink from this one? Five bucks? Five bucks. No. How about if I give you five dollars to drink from this one? No. No? This one? No, thank you. I, I think I still want that one. How about ten dollars? Ten dollars no. to drink out of this no. one? No. Ten dollars? Yeah. You sure? Yeah. No. Ten dollars? Ten dollars wouldn't do it. No. <laughs> Five bucks. <laughs> Ten bucks? Uh, no thanks. You want the pure one? Oh yeah. yeah. All right. Here you go. Oh, oh thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Purity matters big time, doesn't it? Right? Big time, especially when it comes to that. And uh, and again, how many of you guys would like to take a drink from that one bottle after six miles have been on it? Do you really need it? I don't know. I'm really tempted to do that. I just you don't. Hey, keep your five. 10 bucks. I'm just, ooh, I'm just, I'm really thinking about doing that. You know, it doesn't even in your head, right? And that's just water, right? And then that's just them. What was on their lips before that? Did they go to KFC or Popeyes or Cane? Yeah, you got chicken juice. Right? Your mind goes crazy, but listen, it's just water. We, we, we know. Ah! No, because what? Purity matters, right? You don't know where their mouth has been. That's gross. I'll get, I'll, man, this is one of the funniest things ever. Real quick, because we got to close. This is, I was preaching at a conference in Colorado and uh, uh, had taken some of the interns on the trip so they could see what goes on outside the four walls of sunrise, so to speak. And, and uh, uh, one of their wives got there was Carly, Robin Carly. And uh, so uh, afterwards, we went to this uh, place to get dinner after I was done speaking. And everybody's there eating. And it came time for dessert because we're at conference time. And everybody's working hard and running hard. And so we're at dessert time. Let's get desserts, whatever you want. And, uh, of course, this guy's word in the big, giant Mongo, whatever, the biggest, that's what we do, our own thing, right? But the ladies, you know, you're more modest, right? Oh, I, I couldn't eat the whole thing, right? Right? So Carly and this other lady volunteer, uh, they decided to share, right? Because, oh, we can't eat the whole thing. To share this, it came in like a big skillet, right? And it was like a giant cookie with, like, fudge and syrup and just this chocolate gooey mess, man. Chocolate chips, oh, that's whatever. And, and they were sharing that. They used to have a spoon, but they were sharing, eating out of this skillet thing, right? I, I couldn't wait. I l- deliberately waited until they got about halfway done. And, and Carly's man, and this other lady's, and so I asked the other lady real casually, I said, hey, uh, um, uh, has that scab gone away on your lip yet? And Carly goes, <laughs> I thought she was going to puke it all over the table, man. It was so funny, right? And, uh, uh, but anyway, why did Carly react that way? Instantly. Because purity matters, right? It's, oh, scab on their lip. I can't know I was eating it. Oh, go brush your teeth and all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, in, and, and then again, how much more so with water? Uh, in fact, you know, we get wigged out on water. Uh, I mean, you're probably, I, I can't drink tap water. I got to have purified water. Uh, and we got to have a filter. I got to have, I, I, I can't, if I drink from the tap, I'm going to die. Because what? purity matter. We spend, listen, I even did the research. We spend tons of money on purified water, water equipment without even batting an eye, right? We'll let everything else go, but nope, we got to have that pure water, right? Uh, we spend, listen, 16, not million, $16 billion a year on bottled water, which is 2,000 times more expensive than tap water, right? But, and that's not even counting the purifying equipment, right? That we just got to have, you know, so who knows what the real number is, okay? And why do we do this? Because I've got to have that pure water. I'm going to die. I'm going to get disease. It's, it's, I'm going to, listen, this is what Paul is saying to you and I. You need to have that pure life, right? Now, I, I don't know if you've ever uh, had kids that ever did this uh, as a parent, if you've ever reached that stage yet, but um, when, when you first have kids, right, and they come up to you with the big boo-boo lip, <laughs> And, and you got your own drink there, right? And they hey, can I have a drink, Bubba, oh, right? And and so you know, but you you love your kids, you want to give them a drink, but then you spy what's going on with their facial structure, right? They got snot coming out, right? They got goobers coming out of their mouth from whatever meal they had last, right? Saliva's dripping off their chin. And so what do you do? You love your kids, so what do you do? You let them have a drink, right? Sure enough, what happens three days later? You got pneumonia, right, and things of that nature. But I don't, have you noticed this? You do that. You make that sacrifice as a parent, and what does your kid do? When they become a teenager, they turn on you, right? Because then when it's your turn, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. When it's your turn, and you suffered with 852 accounts of pneumonia from saliva face sharing, right, 
And then it's your time. Can I just have a drink? I don't want the whole thing. I just want to sip. Oh, no. Get your your own straw. The double straw breaks your heart. You know what I'm saying? They come out and they do that to you. Why? Because they're starting to get older and they know that what? Purity matters. I don't know where your lips have been, Pops, right? I'm sitting there going like, can we share the same DNA sample? You're going to survive, right? Uh, Mucus lips, you little... But as you can tell, I'm not, I'm not bitter about it. But this is what Paul's saying here. We need, listen, not purified water, not a purified dessert without somebody's scab being in there. We need a purified life every single day. And it's common sense. More so than water or a dessert or drinking after somebody with mucus. We need, listen, we need a purified life every single day. We need to put on this practical breastplate of righteousness, holy, pure living, okay? Why? Because listen, just as unhealthy water leads to what? It will lead to sickness and sometimes even death. Paul is saying, listen, a spiritual unholy life leads to sinfulness and defeat. Why would you do that? It's common sense, way more than purified water. A purified life protects you, keeps you healthy spiritually, keeps you able to resist the disease and the temptations when the enemy is trying to come at you, okay? And that's what he's saying. It's the choice we have to make every day, okay? Uh, In fact, that's what James also says. Why in the world would you deliberately pollute your life with something unholy? In fact, he actually uses a very similar terms, James 1, 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as what? Pure, you know, like purified water and faultless, right? No disease, so to speak, to use the analogy, is this, to look after orphans and widows in the distress and to keep oneself from being what? Polluted by the world. In other words, why would you choose to be polluted by the world? In other words, why would you put sinful junk inside your vessel? Why would you purposely choose every day, because it is a choice whether you realize or not, to be an instrument of wickedness instead of putting on the breastplate of righteousness. And as we all know that if you ingest pollution, it will make you sick, sometimes even kill you. If you ingest uh, diseased water and germs, then that's not good for you. And and if you suck down a chocolate dessert after somebody's got a scab on your face, that's probably not good, right? Uh, Then listen, do you really think that sinful, polluted, unholy living won't make you sick and vulnerable spiritually? And by the way, the scripture is clear. God blesses obedience, not disobedience, not unrighteousness, not unholy living. He can't because he's holy, holy, holy. And if he did, he would be going contrary to his character and contrary to his word. And if you want God's blessings and if you want to stand firm, then you need to be completely immersed, make that daily choice after you get the belt of truth on. God, I want to be an instrument of righteousness today. I choose righteousness, right living as defined by you. I don't want to have a diseased walk with you today. I don't want to walk around as a scabby Christian, right? I want a holy walk with you because I don't want to have a crack or a chink in my armor for the enemy to work with. Because the moment you start going down that route, what's he going to do? <clears throat> He's going to jab you. You left yourself vulnerable. One guy, he puts it this way. He says, Dwight Moody once said, we Christians should live in the world, but not be filled with it. Just as a ship lives in the water, but if the water gets into the ship, what happens? You sink to the bottom. And it's the same thing with the Christian. We live in this world, but don't let the world get into you or you're going to sink. If there's a defect in our character or someone of integrity because we have been polluted by the world, that person is sinking. They're unguarded. And this will be a sure point of attack by the enemy. Just as David was tempted to commit the enormous crimes that stained his memory, and just as Peter denied the Lord, uh, so it is with the Christian today that's been assailed and has fallen, all because they were lacking in this armor of righteousness. Having the breastplate of righteousness is our only hope. The more righteous we become in our character, listen, the harder it becomes for Satan to tempt and wound our spirits. Why? Because there's nothing to work with. There's no crack. The more righteousness becomes our part, of being, the easier it is for us to resist sin and to resist Satan, right? It was this incorruptible integrity of Job and in a higher sense of Jesus that saved them from the temptation of the devil. 
right? And it's rare now today that no one can successfully meet the power of temptation unless he is righteous in his character. You must put on the breastplate of righteousness if you're going to successfully face the enemy. And listen, this is a forgotten commodity in the church today. But you need to know it because without it, you're going to lose. You say, well, what do you got to lose? Number one, you're going to lose your joy. He said, I'll promise you that. If you don't live a righteous life, God will withhold from you his blessing. No obedience, no joy. The reasons why Christians today are so sad and depressed so often and sometimes is because they have no, so, and so much sorrow in their lives is not because they necessarily need psychological counseling or some relational problem. It's a lack of personal holiness. That's the bottom line. The church today has pretty much ignored this and we substituted it with programs, seminars, and counseling. Remember back in the day, you know, they had fire and brimstone preaching, which apparently is illegal in the church today, right? You can't mention hell, even though that's what Jesus died on the cross to save us from. But remember, it used to be old, old man, backsliding. What was, back, what was a good old backsliding sermon about? God is holy, stop living in sin, get out of this world, be a, a positive advertisement, Jesus, get out of sin, get out of sin, get, be ye holy as God is holy. We're not trying to earn a way to have none of that stuff, but out of, be, do you see what I'm saying? Get back to holy living. It used to, be, used to be a mainstay in the church. Not anymore. You didn't hear nothing about that because that's convicting. He says, listen, if you've got problems in your life, then the first place you need to look at is your own holiness. If you've got problems in your marriage, that's the first place you need to look is your own holiness. And I'll guarantee you right now that if you're not living a holy life, you're gonna have problems because God is, listen, withholding his blessing. He has to, because he doesn't bless that which is opposite of his character. David knew it. David knew when he was in sin, he said to the Lord, what? He didn't just ask for God's forgiveness. What did he ask? Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. He didn't lose his salvation, but he wanted back what? The joy of my salvation. I got my salvation. I just lost the joy. It's a matter of a righteous life. Christianity today is run around, I like, I like this, trying to tie on a paper armor. You know, like when you go into the restaurant with your kids and they come out with that little paper thing, they tie it around your neck. He said, that's the typical modern Christian breastplate. It's useless. He says, it's made up of a system, a program, methods instead of holiness. People come to us and say, you know, I, I've got problems in my life and our family's having problems. And we say, well, well, I guess what you need is about 10 or 12 sessions with the counselor. And they put on that paper breastplate. He said, listen, that's not what you need. What you need is about 10 to 12 hours in the presence of God until you sort out all the unholy characteristics in your life. And you need to get right with God. That's what you need if you want to get rid of your problems. He says, we don't need any more programs. We don't need any more methods. We need the breastplate of righteousness. We need to emphasize personal holiness and we need to get it on now. Why? Because you can get the joy of your salvation back and not just get rid of your problems. But you can stand strong, stand firm. Enjoy God's victory that he's already given to you. When There's no crack. There's no place for him to needle his knife to get you. Enjoy your day. Have a great day. Be a great weapon of warfare a hoplon for Jesus Christ. That's it. Can I do that for you? I can't do it. Can you do it for me? No, just like the Roman soldier. He had to put that thing on, man. And that was a deliberate choice. I got to put it on. I got to make sure it's all on. I, I got to make sure it's covering all where it's supposed to call. And it's all, I'm totally immersed in that thing. Now I'm ready to fight. And it's the same thing with us. So examine yourself, examine it. You got problems? Check your own holiness. Are you faithful in reading God's word? Is a prayer life what it ought to be? Are you loving your family and other people the way you should? Are you speaking for Jesus Christ unashamed in our culture, wherever you go, wherever you are? Are you living a holy, pure life as outlining God's word? No, then guess what? Don't expect his blessings. You know what the scripture says God's doing? Hebrews 12. He disciplines those whom he can't stand. Nope, wrong translation. He what? He disciplines those whom he loves. And I'll close with this. I'll never forget the, uh, we didn't even have kids yet, but we watched uh, my sister's kids, my nephew and niece uh, for uh, various stints. And when they were younger, elementary school, and uh, <clears throat> man, they, they came from an environment. After about six months, we had them whipped into shape. And uh, they were, seriously, it's, you, you get back to a standard, God's standard, and kids will rise to that standard as long as you don't budge. Right? But man, when they first, ooh, and sure enough, and part of that consistency is discipline, right? 
And I remember that first time I had to spank uh, my nephew and my niece. And, uh, uh, and, you know, this, this might sound kind of corny, and I, I'm just their uncle. But after I was done, I actually cried because I love those guys, right? Now, I will admit, after about the fourth time, I wasn't crying anymore. <laughs> Don't tell them that. <laughs> but why was I doing that? Because I loved them. Because I knew that if you keep going down that unrighteous path, you're going to head up for a hard life. Oh, oh I, I, I'll never stop being your uncle. You'll always be my uncle, and I'll always love you. But I'm going to spank you because I see what apparently you're not ready to acknowledge yet. You go down that wide road, it's going to lead to destruction. And I'm going to love you enough to spank you right back on the narrow road. God's not being me. He disciplines those whom he loves. But don't sit there and go, why is God doing this? How can we keep having problems? Why don't you that? If you're sick and tired of getting spanking, put the breastplate of righteousness on, right? It's that simple. And get back to enjoying God's blessings in your life, your marriage, your home, around you. It's that simple. Why? Because God blesses obedience. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we love you and thank you so much for our study tonight. And uh, thank you again for your truth and just revealing to us, God, this wonderful truth that uh, we are going to heaven, not on our own righteousness, no way, uh, but by the righteousness of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And what a comfort that is. But we also thank you, God, for your encouragement to, to be those hoplons for you, those instruments of righteousness for you. And we pray that that would take place, that we as your church would be that holy example, that people would see, not us, they would see your holy and righteous character, Jesus, in us by your Spirit, because that's what they need to acknowledge. If they're going to be saved, they've got to first realize there's a problem that you are holy, and that they are not. May we never accommodate our standard of living to this wicked world system. May we never budge from your truth. May we maintain your standard of righteous living as you define it, so that people would be encouraged they need to have the righteousness of Christ today. Use us, God, not just for us, so that we can enjoy your blessings. And we do want that but that others would be one for you. And God, may it never be true of us, individually or corporately here at Sunrise, that we would be those Christians committing spiritual high treason. That we would never offer ourselves this instrument of wickedness, literally to the point where we're not just working for the enemy, but we have no qualms about it. Oh God, may that never be true of us. Use this in a mighty way, God. We ask and pray all this in your wonderful name. In Jesus' name.